Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first time Stephen King reader. Welcome to the podcast that floats down here. Tonight we are talking about Misery, the book, great movie, but the book Misery, which was published on June 8th of 1987. It was 338 pages long. The dedication says this is for Stephanie and Jim Leonard, who know why. Boy, do they. My panel tonight is slightly smaller than usual, but I'd like to call it the big three, the OG of floats down here. The original got... floaters, the o- the OS. Right. I'm Melissa, and I'm here with Ben and Luke. Hi, guys. Hey, that's hey, us. Hey, Melissa. We're here. Yeah, we're here. yeah, we are. We read we a are. book. We made another, <laughs> put another book on your on your uh, Goodreads. Keep your count. I still need to sign up for that. You should, I it's good. currently like 11 books over my year end goal. Are you? I am. And what was your goal for the year? My goal was 24 okay. books on the read count. Um, I am currently, hold on, let me pull it up really quick. I have currently read 32, so I'm eight books ahead of my go. end goal. Pretty good. Nice. My goal was 75. I'm about halfway there, about halfway there through the go. year, not too far off. Feeling good I really thought I'd be busy this year. My, my goal was 12 just enough to keep up with this <laughs> podcast but in fairness i've actually done like if we count the ones on rereads like 17 good you know? so, yeah that's perfect. good stuff man all right i'm gonna go ahead and do the back cover synopsis of misery i think it's pretty accurate sometimes they're a little 
they're a little off, but this one, this one I like. It says Paul Sheldon. He's a best-selling novelist who has who has finally met his biggest fan. Her name is Annie Wilkes, and she is more than a rabid reader. She's Paul's nurse, tending his shattered body after an automobile accident. But she is also his captor, keeping him prisoner in her isolated house. Now Annie wants Paul to write his greatest work, just for her. She has a lot of ways to spur him on. One is a needle. Another is an axe. And if they don't work, she can get really nasty. Oh, that's such a good tag, right? Like, yeah, that's pretty good. I, I, I'm a big fan. Oh, yeah. So, and I'll be honest, I'll be remiss to, admit, you know, to not bring it up. As Melissa said, the movie stands out. This feels like it was almost written for Kathy Bates, like this role, and she just embodied it and everything playing this role. And so I knew all of the Kathy Bates version of this. Reading this was so much better. Like, and I absolutely love Kathy Bates' movie. It's one of my tops. But this just is that much better because there's some cool little things that I had no idea about, like just little intricacies and stuff that stood out to me. So, yeah, like I have definitely in passing seen this movie not that long ago. Glenn, Glenn Dog, who I live with, really likes this movie. And he's like, have you ever seen this movie? He's like, dude, it's all about this guy named Paul Sheldon. And it is fucked. (laughs) (laughs) he was just like man we gotta watch this and so i watched it i was distracted so i didn't really pay attention like i should so some of this was new like i knew the overall premise but going into it i'm just gonna say this book it's pretty darn good it it hits all the points that you think it would when you're basically being held captive by uh your number one your number one fan (laughs) and this book uh audiobook but anyway we always give the page length but it was 12 hours and 21 minutes so Really not that bad, audiobook wise. You can get through that in a day or two, typically. Yeah, I, I actually made it through halfway through the book today, and I started about three hours later because I had to finish uh, Dance with Dragons. I've been working on that on a slow listen through, and I was had like one chapter left. So I'm like, I'm listening at first, and then I buzzed through from like 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Got through like six hours, got two and a half speed. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, made me feel good. But yeah, so I, I, I'll start at the very beginning of the book. Go uh, for it. It's I'm an interesting. Let's jump into big thoughts. Yeah, it's an interesting oh. starting point because it starts in the middle. You know, it it starts in the middle of the story, and you get the backstory of how we got here. I didn't expect that. Again, coming from the movie side, you know, I thought we might get oh Sheldon. You know, he head enters and gets in his mustache or he drinks his champagne, gets in his uh, uh, Camaro. And then this happens because that's how the movie goes. But this, he wakes up and he's like, the tide's coming in, the tide's coming out, and Annie's the moon. And it's like, okay, this is already a thing. And so I'm like, oh, we're already getting into this. So, again, as a fan of the movie and the story of itself, I liked that dynamic because I'm like, okay, we don't need the backstory. We're going to get it down the line. We'll, we'll, We'll get the full meat and potatoes. But let's get into some of the creepiness from the get go. And I think this is honestly. Besides maybe it, the creepiest start of a book we've had so far. Uh, just, I'm trying to remember actually some of the other ones. A lot of them really start yeah. quietly, I would say, in yes. general, um, for the ones that we've covered. Uh, so I think that's probably pretty fair of like right off the get-go, you have an uneasy feeling about what's going on pretty much instantly. Exactly. But I don't necessarily think that the uneasy feeling is oh, there's craziness about to happen. I think it's it does such a good job of embodying what I assume coming out of like a coma or that just being unconscious and not having any clue of what happened. That's what that feels like. The how did I get here? What, what do I remember? What happened that got me to this point? Because I don't know, because this is all I know right now that kind of floating feeling back mm-hmm. to real life and then having to in your mind as you're stuck there recreate all the steps that got you to this point right yeah i mean i i think it's a great start and i think you're you're both absolutely right i think 
it probably is that ebbing and flowing of consciousness. You know, you come in and you're like, nope, not yet. <laughs> so you just like get glimpses of consciousness over time. And like he wakes up and he's like already aware that her name is Annie. So like there's like been subconscious conversations that they've been having, at least to some extent, um, while he was, what do they call it, uh, under the under the waves. I forget what he calls his, his I know the later tide, on he goes. The tide in, rolling out. Hmm? The tide rolling out. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And later on, he calls a different thing we'll get into later, uh, going into the cloud uh, is what he kind of calls it at a certain certain point in the story. But uh, yeah, I think it, it's done really well to show just how cognitively in and out he is and how he doesn't really have a grasp on where he's been, what's going on. And then it does kind of slowly come back to him as he has plenty of time to... Uh, uh, relinquish those memories with not a whole lot else going on. So, yeah, great start to the book, for sure. So, like, most of my thoughts are really, like, end of the book kind of thing, but I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to do more of a, a, a light-hearted, if that exists. Sure. This book. Light-hearted um, torture. Oh, classic. The misery books themselves we get a lot of misery herself, particularly of misery's return, not so much of the the first several books in the series. Mm -hmm. um, but the audiobook version, because I, I will tell you, when I read this, I was painting my whole house, like up on ladders, cutting in at the ceiling. So I would just play this as I was working and then I would stop and sit and pull my book out to wherever I stopped and then read for a while. And then I would have to go back to painting or something. So I put the book down and fast forward. So I, I had a weird experience reading it this time. And the audiobook does such a good job of distinguishing between the misery story and the Paul Sheldon story that for the first time ever reading this, I really got interested in the misery story because up until this point, I didn't care. I just want to know what happens with Paul, right? Before, I, when I had read this book, that part was not important to me at all. But listening to it this time, I needed to know what was going to happen with misery and and her men and all of those things. And so here's my, my question for you. Would we actually read the misery books if they were real books in real life? I don't I don't know. The way they're described, they wouldn't make it onto my list. I mean, like, because no. he's like, oh, they're just a romance. And he's, like, not even a fan of them. He's just like, I just did it to pay the bills. And it, he was always so upset and really disappointed that his, quote, unquote, real work wasn't getting the recognition that he felt it deserved. And it's just this, you know, washy, gushy bullshit that sells so well and he becomes super famous because of something he doesn't even respect. Like that's, that's a whole thing that he's struggling with, but the way he describes it, at least it's not something that I'm probably going to read. Maybe the last one, the last one sounded like it's getting to a place that right. he's almost melding both, which is why he, I think eventually falls in love with that book so much. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think any of the other ones would be something I would pull off the shelf because it just doesn't sound like it's for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, there, there's definitely an audience for those books, and there's a reason why he was successful with them, because it's copy-paste, you know, change this, change that, there you go, easy to do, but it's, yeah, not not anything that would flicker on my radar. Yeah, I, I didn't think you guys would. I'm trying to decide if I would, because I walk a fine line. I'm not a romance novel person, but I can get sucked into a good series not even a good, I can get sucked into a mediocre series pretty easily, right? Like, I'm a sucker for them, whether it's a crime series or a historical fiction series or random YA series. Somebody says, hey, read this book. The next thing you know, I've read all three. That like, just happened. It literally just happened. I was like, hey, Melissa, this is the book we're happened. doing next month for Gets Lit. You should check it out. And then she's like, okay, so I read all the books in the series. Uh, what are you? I was like, I only read the first one. I... As long as right. So I feel like this would be something that if I was like, you know, going on my library app and I have to read something and none of the books I want are available and I'm on hold, hey, let me try it. Or or if it was on like Bailey's or somebody's 
Goodreads list. Which it I would be. Like I was gonna, my I comment was going to be, it would be on her list. It absolutely. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, and I trust her opinion, and, and it might be on Laura's. I've looked at hers, too. So Yeah, like, I was going to say, it would definitely hit Laura's. Right. So I'm like, I could, I could see me like saying, well, if they've read it, maybe I would try it. I don't know. So. But I'm with you, though, on like the getting sucked into a series. I will just say I did stomach through all of the Twilight books. I got Me through too. them. I got through mm -hmm. them, even though there were so much not good <laughs> stuff in there. There was a couple kernels of things that I was interested in that I couldn't walk away from. And they still didn't turn out to be like as good as they should have been. But like that could have been a good book series. It, it had See, and, a thing. You want to know like your book series that was just like that? Because I did the same thing with Twilight. Like, I finished it because I couldn't not finish it. You want to know the other series I had to power through? I would say Chronicles of Narnia for you. I would say Fifty Shades. Fifty Shades. Okay. Hated yeah, it. We've, it was, we've talked about, it, yeah. It was awful. Don't, completely not my thing. Chronicles of Narnia, I just... That's a whole, that's a whole nother rant. <laughs> I'd say it's unlikely so, we're going to talk about Chronicles of Narnia in this. Yeah. So, but Luke, to like, kind of your point, though, I could see, like, Misery's Return being the one that gets so cross-generational or cross-platform that it would hit our radars, and we would be like, you know what? Let's give it a shot. We'll give it a shot on this one, and then knowing us, we'll, we'd get sucked in and probably go back oh, sure. and read the first 12 or however And many. at that point, maybe you can see the threads that you're interested in earlier, it's so yeah. weird because, like, a lot of book series, and I'll say, like, Twilight, didn't get stupid gushy-gushy to, I mean, it's not good, but there's so much more interesting things going on in the first book that then kind of fall away <laughs> as the books go on. This is almost the opposite, where it's, like, gushy-gushy, boring love stuff, which I just don't care about, and uh, then it finally gets interesting. Like, ah, that'd be a tough sell. That'd be a tough sell. Yeah. All right, next thoughts. M mine are kind of full book big things so bench yeah my have... mine are e early book so okay, like that actually kind of works out well mine yeah. are early book melissa's are end book, book. yeah so it, my next two kind of tie together but i'll go with this one first crazy not stupid yeah. and i love that they hammer home this point over and over and over again it gets introduced very early on it's in the first or second chapter where sheldon's like she's crazy She's not stupid, and that's a mistake a lot of people make, and just my own personal experience. I've made that mistake. It's a hard lesson to learn when you first learn it that there may be a crazy motherfucker out there. Don't treat him like he's dumb. He knows what's happening. He just has other shit going at the same time, and that's exactly what Annie is, and King does such a good job of making you know you know, because, like, she, when he calls out, like, the deus ex machina, he's like, well, that's the god of the machine, and she's like, I know what it is, you know, and you could tell she actually did. It's not like, a, oh, yeah, I know, I know. She knows what it is. She just maybe not, didn't know the term, you know. That was the one thing she didn't, you know, catch, but she knew exactly what he was talking about. And she had specific and, examples from shows that she watched growing up that were like, I know that's, exactly that's, what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's going into my next point, and I'll get kind of my stuff knocked out here because these are two big things. I want to go. I want to yeah. go right on oh. on your last comment though uh, before yep. we jump because, sure. All I'll say is I haven't finished it yet, but I have watched half of season two of Castle Rock, mm. and good grief! If you haven't watched Castle Rock season yes. one, I'll just say unrelated to this book, one of the most brilliant shows I've watched in years. Absolutely yeah. brilliant! It's incredible. It's incredible. Watch it. There's like two episodes at the very end of the season. I'm like, that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen on TV. There have yeah. been twice. Anyway, so I'm halfway through season two, which is all about Annie Wilkes. Annie Wilkes. Um, I guess before this, um, if we're going to say it's canon, I would assume it probably is to an extent. I don't know. I'm no king canon expert at all. but It's in. It's universal. It's one of the universes. And And I feel like having seen some of that, I didn't realize that it was going to be a thing. Cause then I was like, Oh, I've been watching season two. And I was excited to tell Glenn that, Oh, um, Oh, what's his name is in it. Uh, uh, um, Andy Dufresne, Andy Dufresne's in it. And I was like, yeah, Oh, Hey, yeah. look, it's him. And he's like, Oh, who, what? Like Annie Wilkes. And I'm like, how the hell do you know that? And he's like, well, Benji told me that Annie Wilkes is in it. So clearly I'm like, <laughs> who is that? I don't even know what you're talking about. He's like from misery. I'm like, Oh, okay. 
So that co- totally colored the way I read this mm-hmm. book because I knew a lot about her as a character. I'm not saying it's perfect adaptation necessarily, but there yeah. is a lot that I gained from her character by watching that show and watching her almost devolve from time to time and do that thousand yard stare and just go blank. And yes, I got a lot out of that show and it, I think helped me get into this book even quicker because I had that same. And, and, she and, and I'm brilliant. glad you're into that because uh, her, yeah, her, the character, the actress who plays her does a fantastic job of mimicking Kathy Bates's, uh, Annie Wilkes, who does a fantastic job of incorporating the book Annie Wilkes. So they all work well together, and you see the ties and the build and everything. And, yeah, I, I absolutely loved second season of it. I hadn't read the book yet by that point, but I had seen the movie, obviously. And so I knew the little plot points and the hits they were in. And there is stuff that I caught in the season from that's book-specific that we didn't get shows, the you know, movie-specific. So they kind of tied both things together. And it's it, it's very well done. I, I, I enjoyed I, – I'm glad you're into that. Oh, that's so, awesome. Great show. Highly yeah. recommend so my other last point, kind of going to the crazy not stupid, is when she goes into her chapter stories of when uh, Paul first writes the very first chapter of Misery's Return, and he writes it's like a three-page thing, and it's all gushy, and oh, I returned, I'm back, I crawled my way out, I wasn't actually dead, and she's like, no, that's cheating. She was dead. The doctor wasn't there, and she knew every single point. Like She's like, I loved it, it's great, don't get me wrong, I could buy into that, but at the same time, it's cheating. It's not fair. And as fans of a show that we covered extensively uh, in our time, we're well aware of how writers just cheat to get away with, oh, eh, nobody will notice that, or so what? Who or cares? consolidate and, things. Or consolidate. And it's like, no, that's cheating. That's not fair. And I think that's where a lot of anger from like our friends in the community get and from where I've had a lot of it. And I never realized that until I read this, they cheated me. They they gave me they told me one thing and then the very next week they gave me something else and i can understand annie's frustration now maybe not to the core anger that it drives her into but i can understand it as a huge Your part of a fandom are wrong your actions about the feeling however <laughs> yeah exactly you know yeah, so but like i love you know listen to that today i actually because i was going at two and a half speed just try burn through refresh the memory but when that part came up i'm like i'm slowing this down because it was just it just hit right like that right moment that right feeling of and it goes back to the she's crazy not stupid and she even says i'm not right in the head but i'm not dumb and i'm not weak or slow and that's when she runs up <laughs> just that imagine that scene like just picturing that where she comes down and breaks his kneecap or oh, j- like just with her fist like doesn't break it, but like just slams into it. And as a guy with knee problems, it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I felt that one too. Um, I really thought, so like just as an audiobook, I'm also, I typically go pretty quick through books. This one, if you're going to listen to it, I highly recommend taking your time with it. It's, it's like a good comedy, right? Timing matters on a lot of this. And this is written in a way that if you let the story simmer, and build it's easier to get into it it's one thing to like you know blitz through the narrative and get the high points and then go through it again to like that's fine but at some point if you're going to be into this book take your time with it and whether it maybe even just physically read it too like that's that's great but if you're going to audiobook it i do recommend taking taking your time with it and another thing i found really really neat was and melissa kind of brought this up is they did a great job of creating an audioscape that allowed you to know when you were in his novel that he was writing and just the book and or switch switching between because there's one point early on where they're both talking and we get like what she's saying and then what's going on inside his head so you get like this split scene kind of thing going on and they do a pretty good job of fading out the audio in a right a right way that you can kind of tell that there's a there's a narrative a narrator jump going on here which i think is very important and uh, obviously after this is two years after it came out He's had a lot of narrator jump things to practice, so he's gotten really good at it. And just one more thing on the audiobook itself, the, one of the ways that they show you that they're going into uh, the, the, the novel inside the novel is they have kind of an audio cue of music that plays, which really brings me back to like a radio horror theater type show. Mm-hmm. And I, I know there used to be hundreds of them just on the radio, right? And 
there's a couple of podcasts that do things like this too, where they're just telling almost like, you know, full character cast uh, stories. And then they have the little musical interludes to start telling you hints and keys. So I, I think it's just whoever actually produced this audiobook spent their time to make it an enjoyable uh, presentation, I think. It's not just reading the words. It's, it's really a performance. And the narrator was, I thought yeah. she did a wonderful job. Oh, absolutely. And my only takeaway with him, my first time through the audiobook, the audio cues besides uh, the jump from uh, the novel to the story is, I guess, the best way to put it. Uh, there were some like audio sounds and musical cues while they were speaking and talking, and it jarred me a lot the first time through. And like are the first couple chapters where it was like, what the hell, you know, what the hell? Like that just, it, 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 it's jarring. But then you, like you said, you kind of get the feeling there. It's the little nuances that they're doing. And yeah, she did a fantastic job. Uh, I know she's uh, from, I believe, Stargate One. She's an actress in Stargate One, if I remember correctly, uh, the narrator on that. Yeah, she did a fantastic job. And then, yeah, like you said, they, without the visual cues of what's a quote and what's a thought, you know, the the subtle changes and the tone and everything to make you know he's just thinking this. Because if he said this, she would literally, you know, ax his foot maybe a little sooner. Yeah, no, she she really harnessed the tone of inner thought and speaking voice really well on a male voice, which isn't actually natural for a female actress to do, but it was a thousand percent believable. I thought she did an awesome job. All right, so I'm going to jump to my line, my, my, my last other thought here. Once again, as I was listening to this, a lot of it was um, audiobook out loud in my house as everybody's working and so <laughs> for the first time ever bob actually like got some content right we've been doing we've been recording shows since 2016. never once does my husband want anything to do with any of this does not want to know about it does not want to watch it he watched one of the it movies with me like that's been kind of it right his his participation is like minimum, mi minimal would be high to describe his input. But he was forced to listen to some of this book with me because I was, you know, on letters and you know, playing through the house. And like, I, I was listening. I was like, oh, oh, she's going to chop off his foot. He's like, wait, what? Why is she going to chop off his foot? What's going on? I would like ask questions. So I'd have to like stop it and explain. And then we'd be done working. And so I'd pick up my book and I'd be reading. I'm like, uh, she just chopped off his foot. So there was one night I was reading the book because I was almost seeing, I'm like, okay, I got to read it. And all of a sudden the line was, and I don't know where it is. It was just like, there must have been some sort of time jump from the chopping off of the foot to like the next chapter. And the line was something like, yeah, that must have happened after the thumbectomy. And I was like, what? Yeah. I jumped and I was in bed so Bob kind of jumps next to me. He's like, what? I was like, apparently she cut off his thumb and he didn't even like, like it's so not a thing that he didn't even tell us about it in real, t in his real time. It's like, I, I, like I was so, sh I, the foot was shocking. I'm not saying it wasn't, but we lived through that with him. But the fact that like time had passed before he decided to up his inner monologue again, I will that it was post thumbectomy, that it just kind of happened and wasn't worth noting at the moment. That's what, that's like what hit me. I'm like, I, I will stay up and finish this book now. I'm so and glad you brought that up because I read that and I was like, what the hell did I miss? And even like the second time through, I was like, <laughs> they never like said that. Like, no, that mm -hmm. wasn't a thing. Like, we don't know about that. And like, I'm so glad you put it that way because like, I was like not going to go back and keep looking for it, but I'm just glad that... I you put it in like the right way, the right frame for, yeah, it just wasn't as big of a deal for him because he was so distraught. I actually just... did go back. Okay. Oh, sorry. I did too. Sorry. Yeah, I actually did I go did back. And me, me and Melissa talked about this uh, before. And like, I'm like, wait, because I, I normally listen to one of my work and sometimes it's playing and I'm thinking about other stuff. So I'm not super focusing. And like, it'll be a good 10 minutes where I can blank out and it's just playing. And I'm not, and then I'm all of a sudden I hear that. I'm like, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. I, I start scrolling back. I'm like, no, okay, we're in a misery chapter. Where, what, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm like, where yeah. did I miss this set? Is it? Did I miss it that far back? And it like it really messed with me because I like 
just because I blanked for so long. I felt like I blanked for so long. And again, like, but I, I enjoyed it. Making an audiobook comment, Audible has started splitting their files into multiple parts. So this book was split into two to make it faster downloads. And I'm like, no, just give me the whole freaking thing. But anyway. Um, it, I'm pretty sure that the cut in the book happens right after the cut of the foot, and uh, it's like the big oh. middle of the book, you know, that is like the fallout from there. And that might not be totally. I think it is. I think that's true, um, because it was like just at the beginning of part two that she that he says thumbectomy, and I'm like, all right, well I'm not going back to oh, the other part. Here it is. Okay, so she chopped off his foot at the end chopped. of section two. Okay, so there's four sections in this book. Okay, then absolutely and, that was the split okay. of the audiobook. Yeah, so section one is Annie. Section two is, I don't really know. Um, end of section two ends with her chopping off his foot, right? With, and with that's when the pre, cloud came back and they uh, died. Pre-op injection. Wait, did yeah. you just say yeah. pre-op injection? What? <laughs> Annie? So then we go to section three, Paul. Okay, and then... The first chapter in that is a really short blurb from Misery with the missing N. And then the T falls off. Yep. Which yes, yes. Really cool to read. To, I'm so glad I actually read this because I would have missed that, I think. Yeah, I didn't know they did that. Like, that okay, that's cool. That's awesome. You can see the missing ends, and then at the yeah. end, that last word there is oh, supposed to be they. They. The T fell off. That's cool. That is cool. That's, so a, that's a, a lemony snicket style, like it is, right? Yeah. When okay. you play with the text on the page, you're gonna get us to be fans. Of I have it. a different yeah. thought about that that you will appreciate, but I'm so I'm gonna read you chapter two of section three. Paul picked up the typewriter and shook it. After a time, a small piece of steel fell out onto the board across the arm of the wheelchair. He picked it up and looked at it. It was the letter T. The typewriter had just thrown its T. He thought, I am going to complain to the management. I am not just going to ask for a new typewriter, but fucking demand one. She's got the money. I know she does. Maybe it's squirreled away in fruit jars under the barn, or maybe it's stuffed in the walls at her laughing place, but she's got the dough and T. My God, the second most common letter in the English, English language. Of course. He would ask any for nothing, much less demand. Once there had been a man who would at least have asked, a man who had been in a great deal more pain, a man who had had nothing to hold on to, not even this shitty book. That man would have asked. Hurt or not, that man had the guts to at least try to stand up to Annie Wilkes. He had been that man, and he supposed he ought to be ashamed but that man had two big advantages over this one. That man had two feet and two thumbs. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was more shocked by that by than the actual chopping off of the foot. Yeah, the, the only thing the foot chopping thing uh, shocked me on was because it's different than the film. Film went with sledgehammer over axe and cauterizing. And so when I see her, when they see them start talking, she's like, Annie, no, Annie. And it's like, and she pulls out an axe. It's like, oh, oh, that's different. Okay, let's hear this out. And it plays a lot, a very similar. And so everything else was like, okay, cool. But it's like, that, that's the only thing that shocked me. But yeah, the thumb thing, not see that one coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. So. Okay, so my absolutely off topic conversation, that little blurb with the missing end. There is a book you have to read. It's sh it's short, but it's written in very specific prose. It's called Ella Minnow P. Mm, okay. Okay. So yeah. like E L L A Ella yeah. Minnow M N M I N N O W P P E A. Ella Minnow P is about a fictitious town who idolizes the writer of the Quick Brown Fox sentence that utilizes every letter in the alphabet mm -hmm. to the point where they have the phrase and the alphabet up on the statue of him in the town. And they really, um, like, they don't really have TV or anything like that, but they really, like, live for language. But 
the sign is so old, letters start falling off. And they take it as a sign from the writer of the sentence that, oh, we shouldn't use the U anymore. And it becomes illegal. And then as more letters fall off, more letters become illegal. And then a deal is struck. If someone else can write a sentence that utilizes all the letters, using less letters than what he did, then they can prove that he's not like an end all be all God because okay. they don't actually think it could happen. Nice. It's fantastic. That sounds great. I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah. Yes. It sounds like a so, Luke book. And it was. Sounds like a yes. Luke book. <laughs> Fucking nerd. So I want to uh, point out uh, a, a note in our chat because if you don't know, we do live stream these on Monday evenings. So follow us on Twitter and everything to find out when we're doing that. But Chrissy Boldstone says the tire marks on the door frame gave me anxiety. And mm -hmm. I completely the wheel, the agree. Wheelchair. The wheelchair marks, but then like over and over and then once she finally catches him and to luke your point where he says the pre-op shot you know the whole build up to the leg being cut off you're thinking how did she find out how did she she saw the wheel marks she didn't know about the wheel marks that was the one thing she didn't catch she caught everything else and just let it play out that's how crazy and how smart she is she's like i can let you do this you can go about my house you can do all this but then i found the knife oh you know, and it, what's the line I'm thinking of, Luke? Oh, oh dear friends, oh good neighbors. They said you know, that in like, here, right? That was yes, used that once. was in here. Was and, and there was another it reference Casprac. of uh, his, the this old is... friend Casprax. Yeah. Yep. Casprax was mentioned. Had, yep, uh, I caught that one too. That was the right before I ended it today. And, and there was like, also ah. a shining reference. There was a guy about ten years ago at the Outlook Hotel who burned the place down. The guy yes. was fucking crazy. He's like, yeah, well, guess what? The guy that banged you was likely as crazy as him. So. <laughs> is what it, Paul, it is a, again inner monologue on that one but yeah. uh i mean for the right, tire tracks like she found the bobby pin jamming the thing knocked him out and that's when she's found the tire tracks so she knew about those he didn't like admit to that I mean, he admitted to it but she did know about that when he brings it up but, she yeah, but that was the last it. thing she noticed sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that was the and very last she thing the she had noticed yep yeah but Either way, fun stuff. All right, Luke, you are the only one left with thoughts. Yeah, and these are these are big overall book things. Um, and I, I did do a little bit of reading on Wikipedia, Goodreads, on just like, hey, other people's thoughts on themes and things. And there's pretty clear themes going on here, uh, I'd say. And I think getting a lot of these books that we've had, we've had an introduction from the author. This one we did not compared to some of the other ones that we've been podcasting about, which I, I find those very helpful to get into King's head and, hey, this is what he's saying is the reason he wrote it and or what he's trying to get at. This one, I just went ahead and looked it up, what interviews with him and such. So your number one, your number one fan. And this, this book, uh, at least from his interviews with him, he says is really all about him fighting his addictions. It's a pretty clear long-term metaphor extended metaphor that Annie is addiction and when you have that hard addiction it's your number one fan it doesn't want you to go anywhere it wants you to keep doing what you're doing because it's gonna be fucking cool and you're gonna love it it's gonna be awesome and they're gonna do everything they can to make you keep and doing nothing's it nothing's going to be better for you than me absolutely not and if you try to do something else i'm gonna cut your fucking foot off like yeah. it's, it, it's and, and if anybody comes try to save you i'm gonna kill them you know because i'm what's important yeah, absolutely. And it's it's such a destructive thing, right? It can be. It can be a very yeah. destructive thing that can take over, literally kidnap you from your life, right? And withhold you against your will. I think it's a really great extended metaphor, and it uh, it's detrimental to your health, depending on what it is. But, like, knowing that, it gave me even greater context for what it was just like an easy slide in of, yeah, that makes sense. That just fits, like, in every level. Really well done. Um, I also thought it was really interesting, kind of throughout the whole story, that Paul typically knows almost exactly what Annie is thinking and, like, the steps that she takes. There's a point where she's talking about going to get his car, and she comes back, and he's like, well, I've dealt with your car, as you probably realized, you know, that I'd have to. And he's like, yeah, I have thought about that weeks ago. Like, they had, like, this whole thing. And it's just so funny, because, like, as I'm reading through this a couple times, I'm... I'm thinking, is there almost like a Tyler Durden thing going on? Like, is this, because it, it just feels like he knows too much about being able to guess what she's doing. And is so right almost every time 
the foot cutting off thing, big surprise. But guess what? Fitting it into the drug addiction thing, a lot of times you know what it can do to you. You know the reasons that it's happening and what it's trying and why it's doing it. That doesn't mean you can get away from it necessarily. And it's a tough struggle. And so just knowing all of those things, I thought it was a, a, a really beautiful, gory, gruesome um, extended metaphor for fighting addictions of uh, substance abuse or, or anything like that. So I think it paints a really great picture, uh, very descriptive of that. So I thought that was awesome. I, I think so many of these early works are, and I say early, but it's really like the first 10 ish years of his career, right? Back in 1990, it didn't feel early, but early yeah. in his career he was, now. In my book, he was around for a long time when I was born a year before that. Right. Right. Um, so I just, I feel like so much of this is him trying to escape his own demons. And it's curious to me because I, I, and I've said this, I did not pick these books with any sort of like, oh, I like these or, oh, I don't like, I literally picked the shortest ones I could find. <laughs> and then I ran out of short books and then I just picked two that I liked that fit like chronologically in like spaces. So I, like, I have no rhyme or reason to why I chose the ones I chose other than yeah. I figured we could read them in a month quickly without, you know, if we were running short on time. And yet over and over and over again, that theme comes up. It was in The Shining. It was, it is Cujo, right? It, it even sort of, it comes up in Pet Cemetery with the not being able to let go, right? The not being able to move on. Life um, on tracks, like story running away from you kind of thing. Yes. And so I just, um, all those different things sort of feel like addiction. I'm hoping at some point we'll stop feeling like that because at yeah. some point he stopped doing that. Yeah. We'll see. see and, yeah, and one other point I kind of wanted to make, if you ask your average reader, average movie viewer, Stephen King character, just give me your top five. Annie Wilkes and Paul Sheldon are in your average reader. Not saying you're a Stephen King fan, but like your average reader, Annie Wilkes and Pennywise and Paul Sheldon are probably easily in that top 10. I put Annie Wilkes right up there with Pennywise as one and two of most memorable like characters. Pop, pop culturally re relevant. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the only other, like between those two movies, you've got the Shining movie and then maybe Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank. Those are like. Yes the big yeah. mainstream it's just hard yeah, to fit so shawshank Andy, into that same yeah. it's just such a different style same with like so, green mile like ugh, i know they're so yeah. much better oh yeah in certain ways but they're I also know. not they the same like it yeah different branch different so, branch of king work but, sorry that uh, literally just popped in my head but uh, it, i had that I note and i changed it up I think it's good but to your points on the you know, on the addiction side of it it's it is interesting because we have Again, when I first read, started reading this and get seen the movie, I'm like, okay, he's a writer. We're reading another Stephen King writes about a writer story, right? What you know, I know, you know, kind of thing. But like that, that's my automatic first instinct. But mm -hmm. the way you guys put it, and I, this is the first book that I didn't go through and do any deep dive and look backstory stuff. So it is interesting. And you're right. As soon as you start saying, I'm like, you're absolutely right. The addiction thing and finding it, it makes perfect sense of it. And he's the addiction and he's the one controlling uh, and it, it's just, yeah, hopefully in the future we can get a little branched out, maybe not write about too many writers. You know, I think we've had every, no, uh, no, Pet Cemetery didn't have a writer in it. <laughs> I'll give it that one. Pet Cemetery did not have a writer. Cujo, Cujo, Cujo a writer. You, he, 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 marketing as writer. I was going to count marketing as kind of a writing, as a creative, like, Carrie, it, it's a loose. Carrie didn't have a writer. Okay, fine. All Either right, way, it's another right. Stephen King book. Anyway, get, right, Stephen right, King right. book about right. a cockadoodie, cockadoodie author. <laughs> I had yeah. to get at least one Annie Wilkesism in there. There was some great <laughs> ones. Cockamamie. Cockamamie. Like cockadoodie. Cockadoodie. Oh man. You know, oh, when she made him burn uh, fast car or uh, yeah, you fast know, cars. and she's like, oh, yeah. fast cars, and she's like, 
you think I'm going down the bank saying, give me my F a check, you bastard. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, in fairness, I get where she's come from. It's that proper kind of lady where, it, where it, but you listen to any of our podcasts and it's like, we fight not to just normally just spew it out. At least I do. I, I know you don't. I, I've dropped I try. F bombs on. Eh, not an accident. They were intentional F bombs. You dirty bird. Yeah. <laughs> you did. but it's one of those paul's not wrong people talk like that and it's right I, you know and we've read so much king he writes like that mm-hmm. and so when you hear that kind of uber christian mentality or you know or that good religious mentality it's like eh, shut up <laughs> you know that's yeah. that's one of the first times Some, like, sometimes yeah, the language up. is just a total oogie mess <laughs> All right, Luke, I think you've got one more. I do. Hey, look, about being a storyteller. I do. So this is probably the, the, the more simple, straightforward, just watch the movie, just read the book. You're going to get this theme really evidently. This is like probably the number one simple thing. Uh, the pressure of creating what your fans want in lieu of what the artist or creator wants to do, right? So he is literally strapped in this room, forced to write the next book that he doesn't really... he he. He ended this series. He was so excited to be done with it. He killed her. He kills Misery, the character. It's done. But that's not what his number one fan wants. That's not what his number one fan wants. And he doesn't have a choice. Literally doesn't have a choice. And I think it's so easy to see how there's a certain pressure put on either content creators of any kind, artists, writers, whatever, Mm -hmm. to do what the fan wants because... At least to an extent, you want to do the famous, but surprise, surprise them in their own way. And as soon as you get popular, it gets tougher to raise that bar. I mean, how tough is it for uh, you know a dream of spring to come out or uh, winds of winter and not have all of these incredible theories out there again and be better than them or trump them or trick them and still surprise and be enjoyable? Like George R. R. Martin has a really big task in front of him, right? But whenever he puts out something else that he really enjoys writing, like Wild Cards, which I enjoy. They're very fun books. He's got amazing side stories and other works that are awesome. Check out uh, Dream Songs. There's a book of 50 of them. They're awesome, his early works. But no one wants to hear that. They just want the next thing in the series that they give a shit about. And that's not very fair to him as a human. And, I mean, I'm not saying go out and kidnap George R. R. Martin, but I feel like some people would and force him to finish it, which is is just not right. Like one, obviously we know that's not right, but it's just not the right way to encourage creativity. You can't put someone's thumbs on tacks and say, okay, now dance monkey, like write the thing that I want you to. Like it's just not gonna be as as motivated and genuine. So I think that's one of the easy things to pull from this book. And I love that he consistently pulls out this Scheherazade uh, character, which if you're unfamiliar with is kind of the the kickoff to the Thousand and Thousand Nights, Thousand and One Nights, Arabian Nights. And um, I look up the story. It's, it's a pretty cool little story about a, 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 a woman who's trying to get the affection of a king who's killed a thousand women uh, in a row uh, after a day of being with marrying them it's a whole thing that she tricks him into staying with her for a thousand nights because she tells him a story and stops tells another story and stops and never really finished it's like the the classic cliffhanger thing and so that's where the a thousand arabian nights stories you know legendarily come from so that's how he feels right he's he's giving her enough so that she doesn't kill him as she's reading over his shoulder right she's she's getting the she's filling in the ends for a long time and so she's reading every single word and reading it along him writing it. And so he's trying not to get to the end too quickly because he knows at the end of my writing this book, I'm toast. I'm dead. That's it. But part of it is also him falling down the rabbit hole, right? The black hole of the story where he gets lost in it. And he can't stop that because you can't stop the story. And he right. wants to finish the story because I think he wants to get it out but at the same time he's not sure what happens when he gets there it's that catch 22 right I have to get to the end I have to be able to finish this I don't care what happens until like after I finish it yeah absolutely if I finish it so if I finish it then that's a whole nother problem so it's 
it's absolutely well, a catch-22 yeah. type situation where you're damned, you want to do it, and you want to do it right because you have personal integrity in your craft. And mm-hmm. also, you know what the end game is when you finish that. And it's it's really funny because another thing that I read on Wikipedia for his motive, King's motivation for reading this was almost going back to uh, more thriller and horror and psychological drama um, after he wrote The Eyes of the Dragon in 1984, which was, I, I haven't read it, but apparently like just a true epic fantasy. And people are like, that's not what we want from you. What do you know? Get out of here. Like you're, you're turning our back, you're back on us. Like, but that's what he wanted to write. Like I, it's just, it fits really well. And it's, yeah. you can see how that mentality is baked into Paul Sheldon so naturally because it's literally just a part of Stephen King that he's dealt with in his own way, put in a different situation. And just, he's a good writer. If you haven't read him, he's a good writer. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad you finally decided that. Oh, I decided that like in chapter three of it. (laughs) So a couple things. uh, Sorry, uh, unless I'm jumping on a couple of your questions and I don't know because I don't know your questions. uh, Two things I want to point out that I just thought of the ending of the book of this, you know, of this story. First of all, when the attack comes, you know, he's plans this whole thing up and he burns the book, quote unquote. I honestly was like 50, 50 coin toss. Did he actually burn it? Like, knowing how much he put into it, I wasn't sure if he had. It had me kind of wondering, there's no chance in hell he burned that thing. He's just toying with her. Isn't that? But then the way he makes it sound, and, like, the, the laughter and the joy, and just the pure, you know, vitriol going towards seeing her face, he's like, I, I thought he probably did. He might have actually burned the damn book after all this time. And, you know, so it was one of those, like, it, it got me on there. And then, I, I'm not going to lie, I was wondering, where the hell did her body go? Like until that very last page or very last two pages, or whatever, I'm like, is she still out there? You know, because we didn't get any confirmation. And then he pops in the, his apartment and it's like, okay, that was well done. Because it left me wondering. I'm like, because I couldn't remember the end of the movie, honestly, either. I remember, you know, little jump scares or something like that, but I couldn't remember. And I'm just like, I don't know if he's just going to kill him off in his apartment now. <laughs> so again, those little things, those little details that make you kind of, huh? you know get you a little bit better than pet cemetery did on their you know quick half chapter of oh and he and what the kid lived and this and that it was that quick yeah. half chapter this one made you like it gave you a, a full chapter almost of uh, i don't know yeah i mean i i will admit it it got me a little bit just because just before that paul had started quoting her And, like, it really seemed like he had actually finally, you know, his egg was cracked a bit. Like, this was just finally too much. And I I wish I had the the book here in front of me with it highlighted. But there's a line where right before all that happens where it's just, like, you can tell he is embracing the demon, uh, right? Of, like, I'm going to kill you anyway. Well, he's, like, you know, uh, he just decides I'm going to kill you. And he kind of quotes her some of the way she says things right around there as well and so with that i was like you know what he's probably just mailing it in he's probably just saying you know what screw it let's just burn this place down because he he knows that she'll do anything she can to save it and like it just felt natural it just felt like you know what screw it my foot's chopped off i'm done you're done too like i'm gonna do it on my own terms and not give you the satisfaction of really seeing how this book ends. Because he knows that's the one thing he can do to her to really, you know, just put a pin in and make him feel, himself feel better about it on his way out. So I bought into it. I thought it was good. I was glad that that wasn't. I thought it was even more brilliant that it was a good sleight of hand. But I'll say I bit. Question time? Yes. Go for it. Okay. Question one. Should Annie have been the one who died? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, because it's storytelling wise. I, I think honestly, they both should have, but the book survived. Like, I would love to have the cops came in, found him hunkered in the hallway, blocking the stair or blocking the door, blocking her in, him dead in the hallway, holding the actual manuscript or whatever. I know it was left under the bed or something like that, but either 
and them coming in, finding the manuscript, and you know, getting it published, bringing it to them, I would have been okay with both of them dying. But had she not, I would have been pissed. What do you think, Melissa? I, I think absolutely she should have. She was a piece of shit. I, like, I feel bad for her, but here's the thing. I think you. I, I like pretty little bows. I like stories that end in pretty little bows. I don't like stories that end with like me not knowing what happened the happily ever after. Even if it's not happily, I like to know what the ever after is. I don't care if it's happy or sad, but I want an ending. I don't just want like a, oh, you know, a smile. And, and they were back on a briny beach, and guess what? Nothing was solved. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So those there. kinds of things bother me. I like that this book didn't do that. It gave me an ending. But I was ready for him to die. I was ready for it to be Paul. I was ready for her to win. And I think I think when I first read this book 20 years ago, if she had lived and he had died, I would have been pissed. That would have just been against everything I believe a story should be and he survived too much and he should have made it. But being a little older, because I'm old, and like more life experience and just having consumed more media and even just delving into Cujo, if you will. I feel like that has really even colored how I see it. There was such a backlash on the boy dying in Cujo that I wonder if he pulls punches because of that. Do you know what I mean? I wonder if... I could see that. Like, there's there's going to be a happy somewhere because Cujo was so bad. You know what I mean? It was so dark and so, so terrible. Good. The right way you should die. Know. The little That's boy should have died. Though. Absolutely should have died. So good. So good. I, I, I was yeah. almost disappointed Paul lived. I don't really care about Annie. Like, if she had lived, that would have been cool. Like, let's see what happens next to her. But more like, I, I wish Paul had had not that I wish but ill on him, but... I, that's where I was like, I thought he burnt the book and killed himself and her by burning the house down around right. them. Like, that's... I would have yeah. been totally okay with that just being the ending of, of that. I, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Or I actually probably would have been okay with Annie, like, had that very final jump scare actually been Annie and she got her revenge. Mm -hmm. I'd have right. been okay with that because I, I do like the darker twists and turns like you said I, i'm fine with i would have been pissed because like oh bullshit but right it, it, it's rightfully pissed but i wouldn't been pissed at him for her living it would have been i'm pissed at the store like it's you know at the circumstances but, this, but it yeah it would have it, it would have emitted emotion like our uh, evoked emotions that mm -hmm. should have been that could have been there and i, I would have been okay with it you know i'm okay with getting pissed off i wouldn't be mad at the writer like with yeah the boy and cujo i was never mad about that it was like one of them had to go you know and the, the chat is out. starting to hit on this but i do really like the way this book ends because we do get the fallout of surviving this and we get him yes. she's never really i mean christy says it in a way and he's still alive in the mind of paul and that's absolutely right he's gonna live with her for years and maybe forever who knows but oh, yeah. you can't just forget this stuff and he they even talk about like oh if you may you know you wrote a non-fiction about your experience like He's like, well, if I did that, I'd never write again. That'd be the last thing I ever wrote. But I'd also probably lie about it. Not intentionally, but it would probably happen. Because, one, it's just it's just messed up, man. Yeah. It's so unbelievable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he wouldn't want to have to do the reliving he would need to to get the detail required. Right. Okay. Question two. When Annie came across the accident, the original accident that Paul was in, she recognized him as her favorite author. What might Annie have done if the accident victim had been a stranger? Okay. I feel, like she, I feel like she probably would have done similar things of nurse him back, but then not have kept them against their will almost like what paul calls out of like what she did was fine until she drugged me and kept me here instead of taking me to the hospital like she is qualified 
to nurse somebody back to health. Like that was, was the right thing. Out and it was treacherous. So. Right. So like for the circumstance, it was the right thing to do. And I feel like she would probably still do that, uh, especially again, kind of letting Castle Rock season two color my, at least the first half, color my perception of who she was as a nurse. And I, I just feel like she has a heart and she has that nurturing mentality. So I think she would do not mentality, but, uh, that's a old <laughs> reference, but, uh, I think she would probably do the same thing, but then also not keep that person and take them to the hospital whenever they first started waking up, you know, a couple of days after when they could actually get in the wheelchair, I think would probably be the day when they could get that person in the wheelchair, get them into the car and take, drive them into town. Yeah. That, that'd be my, honestly, I see her taking them back to the home, banging up the legs, like s- splitting them giving them a few drugs and calling an ambulance like then and there. And even then maybe the ambulance says that's too treacherous. We can't get to him. She would say I can handle it, but it would be almost a automatic kind of thing of her to call. But yeah, as soon as she found who Paul was, it's like, yeah, that ain't happening. That's yeah. So yeah, leave your dad on. What do you think? Melissa? I don't really have an opinion. I like, I like the idea of, she would be caring, but part of me wonders if she would just kill him early. Just because off him right this away. Is, this is not the first. Oh no. That she's killed, or even the first that has like lived with her, and but she has never reason to. They've all been specific reasons why she offed those people. No. Well, but she was an angel of death nurse. Right. Oh yeah, that's so, she killed all those babies. <laughs> that's right. right. She killed all she those babies. And, old people and, and the cop, yeah, which we too. haven't talked about. That was a different. That was a protecting herself thing. But yeah, wow. I, yeah, I, I forgot about that. Have she killed them sooner. Yeah, out of like, uh, like making them lose, like oh, not so they, yeah, so they don't suffer. Out. Yeah, right. they. She would over actually saying that she probably would just take them home, overdose them, and bring them back to the car or some shit. You know, throw them down the river. You she know. killed a lot of people. She yeah. killed a lot of people. It's a pretty good kill count in this book. I know we're not keeping track, but this one's... No. I wouldn't say it's Salem's Lot level, but it's... There's a lot I referenced. Mean, she didn't yeah. kill an entire town. She killed no. a bunch of babies. A bunch of babies, a bunch of old people, and here's the thing. High, high like body count, lowest creature. cast counts. You know, lowest spoken cast counts. It's yeah. pretty small. There's literally six... Oh, look, apart from the last, very last chapter with Paul in New York, there's six people that have vocals or like have spoken. And you're sentences. counting the people within the novel? With within the novel, not not no, not in misery. No, okay, I'm not counting. Yeah, because you, you have you have the like the three, three cops. Police officers. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, three and police officers, two, and then the, and then the editor, the city. Co- yeah, well, the city councilman, our city uh, manager. Yeah. So seven, Edgar. Yeah. Yeah, but still, that's, probably that's low. pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, The Shining was lowish if you don't count hotel ghosts. Yeah, but you had the town folk, you know, the people that... Uh, there were a bunch of people in, uh, part... yeah. in, in the other perspective. Yeah. I so can't think it... of his name. Yeah. He was so awesome. I had... AK, okay. what was his name? Shining guy. The Shine. He's got the shine hard. Halloran. Dick Halloran. Halloran. Dick Halloran. Dick Halloran. I just couldn't think of it. Yeah. That was like months ago, and like I was trying there to is the news of reports, you're right. the friend from the school that he used to drink with. That's who I was trying gotcha. to remember. Oh, yeah. The guy that they Uncle Al hit, maybe hit somebody on the bike. Yeah. Al Shockley. Yeah. Al Shockley. Shockley. Yep. Good Shockley. grief, Melissa! You're on fire. Not like physically, but just you're on a roll. <laughs> okay, here we go. Question three. We kind of touched on it, but I'm going to ask the question because it's more specific than the roundabout way we were discussing it. What are your thoughts on the difference between a story being fair and being good? Hmm. Okay. Good questions. Yeah. I think it, it comes so. down to, uh, <laughs> and that's that really, we're, we're hitting on a lot of these topics. I mean, it's almost like what the author wants to write to compared to, what's going to sell, I think, is is partially it. And how tropey do you want to get? And how anti-trope do you want to get? Or do you just want to tell the fucking story that you want to tell and leave it at that? Like, 
it's 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 got to be a tough thing being a writer. Like it just has to be. It's, well, to me, a fair story has to be something that could actually happen within the context of the world you have created. That's important. Yes, it has to follow the that rules is a, that are very important. Yes, and that doesn't make it a good story. Not necessarily. Sometimes those stories are crappy because they have badly written characters who are one dimensional, or they don't know how to write how people talk, and so the dialogue is shit. But it could be considered fair because it follows the rules and context of that world. Which life usually story. does, and it's usually boring. Like that's right. <laughs> and so I think that was Annie's big concern was. This does not follow the rules of the world you have created. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I feel like a lot of the time, I think of TV shows, especially long running TV shows, and not just Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones, but not just Game of Thrones. Where, <laughs> AK um, just guessed it. She, she, she specifically <laughs> just said Data Dave. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I've been thinking it for like 45 minutes. Um, but it's the idea that the things they are doing, do they fit with the world they've created? And a non-Game of Thrones thing that comes to mind is when Joey and Rachel try dating on Friends. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that, that sounds was like a dumb reference, right? but that didn't fit within the context of the world they created. It yep. didn't work with the dynamic, even though it wasn't a bad idea. But it didn't like it wasn't a fair story. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that's the difference between like the writing that Annie wants versus the writing that the Game of Thrones fans wanted for season eight, right? I think they told a relatively, not including Danny, relatively fair story if truncated. As opposed to, I'm, I'm sorry, as opposed to um, like it being something like the, the dead girl crawling out of her grave for no good reason. Do you know what I mean? And I don't want to get into a whole debate on whether it was fair or not what they did, but it's <laughs> the idea that fans of longtime things don't like where the story goes because they always want more and don't let the authors tell their story. But if the authors stay true to the world, then I think it's fair. And we have to be careful how we judge that. Agreed. Um, and, you know, like like Luke said, and I think fair doesn't mean good and good doesn't mean fair. But at the same time, I'm actually on Annie's side a bit of noticing those things of you're doing this shit and it's not fair. You're cheating. You're jumping you're jumping the line and i'll even throw harry potter in on a few of those like a few of the movie spots where they just assumed people read the books the people read the books knew what was like, going to happen prong? so who's prong who's what prong nobody knows you know yeah exactly you know and so it's one of those of you know people they want to assume that you know but you're not you're going from a to c and skipping b and that's not fair that's not fair to the viewer that's not fair to the reader and so for me, I would rather read a fair story that's fairly well written over a great story that's completely just out there, you know, that just jumps around and skips and doesn't follow context without at least establishing that in the beginning. You know, if you establish on the beginning, such as it, where it jumps around, there's different rules for different things and we don't know exactly it, but they've established that. And so we know that's the case. Apart from just, uh, yeah, Pennywise got bullied to death. Hmm. Okay, sure. You know, it, that's not really fair because that doesn't really make sense. So it's, it, it's I'd rather take the versions are always better. <laughs> I was gonna make a point uh, going right along with both of yours. Benji, did, were you finished? I didn't mean to jump in. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I was just saying that I would rather take a fair story that makes sense over a good story any day. And, and I think I'm just going to echo what you guys have specifically already been saying. Um, yeah, I mean, like, you take Lord of the Rings, right? I'm going to reference Melissa's uh, thesis to get her uh, collegiate degree. Uh, but it's just 
so common that I, I really do think the book to movie adaptation thing is ripe with this, right? It's how do we make how do we make the story sensational? How do we make it exciting and make all the explosions big? Give the Balrog wings, even though they were fucking cut off hundreds of years ago. They don't have wings anymore, yo. They don't have them, but they're cool and they look great. And I'm not gonna hate on Peter Jackson because those movies are incredible. And they are so tight Arwen to the story. Was completely unnecessary. Discuss. Which one? Arwen. Yeah, that's like the one thing. That's the one thing. But, but I get it because you have to have the three. I mean, I and do. It is a very, very Bombadil heavy male funny. cast. Hey, let's make a big thing of one of the few female characters that we could actually use. And it's a famous actress. Like, fine. I didn't think it was overdone. But yes, it's different than the book. Agreed. Um, but. In general, it's so easy to go for the big flashy things that are going to look cool on screen as opposed to, hey, let's actually get to the themes and important things of the story that make a conducive story that makes sense within itself and what was written. And when you get those, and we've had a couple of them in in this, in our podcast here, Cujo, a thousand percent on with exactly what happened in the book of like hitting the right emotions. There was some extrapolation of things, but it all fit narratively it all fit sensibly with the themes and the story that's going on nothing hurt the story i thought it was a great movie about a great book and they work together well yeah you can read the book and get a more in inner monologue context and things like that but i don't think you miss out on much just watching the movie as opposed to innumerable other ones where it's just like i think I think you guys are missing some important things that book readers are going to miss. Like, it's going to be noticed. And it's not a bad movie, but you just, it's a foul ball. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a long foul ball. No, agreed. All right, last question. Ready? Mm -hmm. What would you define as Paul's worst moment in Annie's house? Worst is uh, subjective, right? <laughs> yeah. I know, but you have to pick one. You have to be on the Quidditch team, Melissa. You can't just be the bench manager. <laughs> I'm trying to decide how to define worst. Like that's that's where yeah. I'm at with it. That's up to you. It's yeah. it's how do you pick your MVP, most yeah, valuable moment? Do you go MVM. Luke or do you go Riley with it? So yeah, right. I, I'll, I'll start with mine. His worst moment was when he cost the cop his life. He knew what would happen. He didn't know where Annie was, per se. He she knew she was on property, but he didn't know where he was, and the cop was there, and he just threw the ashtray through the window. I get it. Desperate hope, desperate, you know, motive. And I'm just saying, as a person, if I was in Paul's shoes, I probably would have done the exact same thing. But the aftermath of knowing that he cost that person his life by asking for help or by begging probably would be if i was in his shoes my worst moment knowing that i cost him that i i think that's kind of fair i really just disagree with it though like no, no, he's no, gotta no. he's gotta take the one chance at making a connection he has to he could. He knew that he's he's gone through everything in her head mentally, and he knows that it can be dangerous. But he never used the phone. He never even tried to use the phone. Right? He knew that if he did, yeah. it wouldn't either work, or he just knew that it wasn't going to work. It wasn't an option. Yeah. You have someone there who's armed, and yeah, he's young, but should be somewhat trained in handling a situation like this. And it turns out that hey, guess what? He's specifically there looking for you. So like. Or at least he has the photograph. He's like, oh, my God, it's you. Like, dead. But you have to take that chance, I think. Can I rebut on that? And when I say worst moment, I don't mean his worst action or anything. I think what would have affected him mentally as what he would look back as his worst action because he cost the person his life. Not that he's sad he did it because you're right. He had to take that chance. But it's at the same time him doing that cost that young man his, his life. And so it's not like it's it's an absolute worst moment. Absolute worst moment is she's gone for 51 hours. I got to drink my pee because I'm that thirsty. That's, you know, a, a bad moment in there. But the 
moment where he did that to me like just He's going to live with that knowledge. moment more regretfully than anything else. Yes. And I'm talking regret. So your, definition, your definition of worst is what does he have to live with? Yes. Luke, how about you? That's tough. I'm going to go with more of like one of his lowest points. Like for him, what he had to go through. And obviously like the axe to the foot. That's a big one. Um, but I think I was kind of describing it earlier of when he finally is getting to the closing end of the book. And at least like on the first time reading through, I looked at this as, okay, he's broken. When he starts talking like her about her and, and just, it seems like he takes on some of her characteristics in how he's describing things to me. That's where I really thought again, like, which is why I so easily bought that he did burn the manuscript to, to, to burn the whole house down with both of them in it. To me, that was his, his worst moment of, He's broken. He's done. He's let her play her games. But also, it's like, you know, at your worst point, you could also have your opportunity to be your best. And it turns out he was his best at that point from what we saw. But just like on the initial read through, I just look at that point being like, okay, he's flipped. Like he's he's ready to burn the world down just to just to save himself. And by saving himself in that moment is killing himself and her too, because he knows it's a zero sum gain on anything so i guess that's what i'm gonna go with there are plenty of terrible spots for paul uh, just what a what a life i like all of your answers so i'm not gonna say you're wrong i don't think you are um i'm gonna go with what was the worst thing he had to live through does that make sense so yours is like what was his lowest then jesus what does he have to live with mine is what did he have to live through and that's hard because there's a lot of things he lived through at what point does the downward slope become a 90 degree angle right that's how i'm looking at it because there was a there, there was a lot right like being stuck in his room having to not have the meds to not is it when she burned his book that's a pretty low moment it, that the moment when he realized like oh like she'll do anything because i think you could pick chopping off the foot that would be my other like big one yeah but i don't think that was surprising i mean i think it was shocking at first of like what do you mean pre-op shot but I, he didn't put it past her to do it's not like he was like there's no way she's going to do this it was more like please don't do this but I think he absolutely knew she would and could. But I think it was burning his book that he was like, "There's she's not really good. She's not really going to. Oh, no, she's really going to. And that's where you hit the slippery slope and you are just downhill fast. Because he didn't even mention the thumb. I mean, yeah, like, he right. it, it wasn't even a thing, right? And that was right after the foot. So at that point, so it might be the foot, but it also might be burning the book. It's just a matter of which one is the like most disbelieving that you have to get over. No, she's really going to do it. Yeah. And to your point, Melissa, well, with that, with the book scene, him burning the book, two questions or two, a question after this, that was also part of the addiction side of it. His addiction to the pills is what, is what pushed him over the edge to finally submit to burning the book. It wasn't the, you know, uh, mm -hmm. fear of wanting to get out, fear of leaving. It was the drug addiction. So going back to Luke's point of this story is very heavily related to addiction and stuff. You're willing to give up anything. He literally gave, he wrote this for a year and a half or whatever. You right. know, he gave up a year and a half, 1,987 words, you know, or it's something, I can't remember the exact number. It would have been but, way higher than that. No, it was 190,000. I know that. 190,000. 190, you just you said yeah, 190,000. 190, 1, oh, sorry. 190,000. Sorry. I was like, that's not very 87 long. 87 words. That's like a short essay. <laughs> yeah. But he did that, and it was for the drug addiction. Now, my question is, they only burnt nine pages in that time. He specifically I, only had two. He, yeah, because nine is a number of power. 18. 18. I don't she doubled it because uh, that's a... Uh, a magical okay. number. Okay. Okay. So it's 18 just plus the first and last pages. 
Yes, yes. But what would happen to the rest of the book? Did she hang on to it? Did she destroy it? I mean, is it still That's what we're led to believe, home? is that she destroyed it. But we don't see that on screen. Yeah. For sure. So, so good question. It's easy to read, write 20 new pages of a book that you kind of remember. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, you could figure it out. You could piece together those 20 pages probably, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, yeah. I think I, I think I, she would have I think she would have followed through because there's so it's so often talked about if if Annie wants it done, she's going to follow through. She is a follow through yeah. person. If she says it, it was done. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Narrow narrow path. All right. Now it's time. Benji, yeah. what's your oh, favorite shit. thing? Can we go with yours first? No. Damn. All right. So this is a because again, we've had a bit of delay. I did not keep up on it, so I only have like great, me- like great memory of what I got through today. But my favorite thing from I'll go with the first half of the book is the you know the just the dynamic of how quickly he realized he's fucked. It's not even it wasn't even a question in his mind in the first twenty minutes of the audiobook. Like, after the first 20 minutes, you knew there's no chance for him. And he knew it, too. And now it's, how do I get out of this? And so just the the ultimate feel of peril, I guess, is going to be what my favorite thing is. Just how is he going to get out of this? I hope it has a happy ending. I hope maybe the book was different. than, Or I hope the book's the same as the movie. But the ultimate feel of peril is probably my favorite thing. Just the general... the constant threat of danger Luke there are so many awesome moments in this book and by awesome again like how are you defining that incredibly well written in the context is what I'm defining awesome as like it is so easy to see how Paul is feeling what he's feeling and thinking what he's thinking with this monster that's in the house with him and just like the little things that he's focusing on, right? Like he knows how many steps it is for her to go from the the living room to her bathroom because then she fills up the water that he gets to drink out of. And it's so well-written. There's so many incredibly well-written moments. My favorite thing, and I'm not even going to go into, we've talked at length about the, the addiction extended metaphor. I think that's very beautifully done. I think it's awesome but I'm just going to go with the axe. I think the axe was just such a cool moment. It just was such, and it, it comes at such a pivotal point in the book. It's like literally right at the midpoint. And when, when she, when he, she says your pre-op shot and she continues talking and he's like, wait, wait, Annie, did you just say pre-op shot? And she just continues on like, no, you know, like whatever. And then they, like that whole scene where she's like, yeah, how many times have you been out of your room? And he's like, three. And she's like, okay, once for food, once for water, and, you know, once for meds. And and so she's like, hey, mom, how many times have you been out of your room? How many times? And she doesn't believe him at all. And he's like, I don't care. It, however many times you want me to be in another room, that's how many times it's been. I don't care. Like, whatever. It just, that moment of desperation, yeah, you're with him. You're like, yeah, okay you know she's not hearing you so and you are telling the truth it's one of those mm-hmm. when someone distrusts you how do you prove to them that you're telling the truth you literally can't it's not possible you can't say but i'm telling the truth well you lied to me before i'm sorry but i'm telling you the truth like where's that line and like i remember as a little kid it was like i was such a bad liar because when i was telling the truth and it was something like i didn't do it I just like didn't I knew that they didn't believe me. I knew whoever it was. Like it was just like I'm my own worst enemy that guess what? It was probably Benji. It was almost guaranteed Matthew. It was, Matthew. Matthew. It was almost guaranteed Matthew. It was not me. I promise. And like I'm like chuckling and like I look so guilty because like I don't believe it. And I know they don't believe it. But how do you convince somebody? Like that's why like, I just don't lie. I just I'm bad at it. So I don't. And you have I just, a guilty face. I have guilty conscience without being guilty <laughs> like it's a catholic thing i think 
but uh, <sighs> but it's just that that scene is so good and like it all comes down to well it didn't matter she's still chopping your your whole foot off so mm-hmm. well done like you hope that he can get get through to her you hope that he can right. just pull her out of her thing but she is when she says she's gonna do something even if it's to herself it's going to happen that's what's gonna happen I, I think that's the pivotal scene in the book, probably the most easily recognizable thing if you've read the book, like the most memorable thing. And uh, I'm going to say that was my favorite thing. Okay. So my favorite thing is the only thing I've really talked about. It was the way we found out about his missing thumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was sucked in. And I will tell you, like in general, over reading through all of these books um part of it feels chore like right i I mean because i've read them i know that like okay i'll read it again but this one it's been a really long time since i've read it and so i didn't quite like i i knew the story but i didn't know how it ended and so it was like it's this perfect in between of i know the story but i don't know where it's going and I was so jarred by that thing that I read earlier, that two page chapter of just out of the blue. I was a man that had two feet. I was a man that had two thumbs. And I was like, (laughs) he, he changed. That was the moment for me where he is just, he is a different person. And he was telling us that, but it was, Oh no, physically even, I am a different person. I am no longer somebody with 10 fingers, like, yeah. but we didn't see it. And, and he's so different that he he's, didn't even think to tell us. Too. He's got multiple conversations. He's got, he's fighting himself more than he ever has. Yeah. I, that was the moment I was like, I, I gotta, I gotta finish this mm-hmm. now. And I did like in however many pages that was well done it was about 130 pages i got it done in about an hour mm-hmm. like an hour and a half I'm like nope i'm going to read because i had to know that was not an option anymore so all, i like all, all well chosen that. favorite things i think yeah. all well chosen <sighs> okay this is the hard part it's now. just gonna keep getting harder too it's gonna keep getting more difficult <sighs> <sighs> I know. I okay. don't know the answer here. <laughs> this is the part I see we have, um, at some point, I'm going to like pull it up. I have a computer, so maybe next month I'll pull it up and actually share my screen so you guys at home, can, those watching along with us can see it. Um, we all have our cursors in our box, and we all have to decide out of seven, now that we've read seven Stephen King books, where does this fall in your ranking of favorites? Is it number one is it somewhere in the middle is it three or four is it at the bottom is it number seven so i'm gonna get i'm gonna quickly read the list from bottom to top so we've got carrie in sixth salem's lot in fifth probably chrissy's fault you know uh cujo in fourth (laughs) the shining in third it in second and pet cemetery is leading the way right now uh so we gotta figure out where this one fits in that grouping (sighs) so this this is probably my toughest one this has the, been the most difficult for me by far because like there, I know there's two where slots I to be. i've got two slots that yeah. i'm struggling with too yeah i know uh, where it falls for me so i'm you going with mine ready, gentlemen i got mine in give me a 10 i count. got mine in nine eight seven five four three two one times up there you go and let me do that. all right i got it three Got two, one, go. Wow. <sighs> I wanted to even oh. put it higher. I was I was actually going lower. Oh, I was I was I was more like, I was closer to where like, Melissa was with it. I was a lot closer. It helps that I didn't like Pet Cemetery and you all made it first. So it's like it's either way. So, okay, so so so, know, so, so, so all right, hang on, like, hang on, Melissa. Oh, so, Melissa's got so it. the rankings Melissa's go... got it. Melissa's got it. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. 
for those of you who can't see our screens, I ranked it one, Luke ranked it three, Benji ranked it three. The average then is a 2.33, which makes its official ranking two. Yes. yes. Knocking it out of. Wow. I'm curious if two, I would five. have gone here, it still would have, it wouldn't have changed. It still would have averaged but a two. I was, yeah. I was, I strongly considered this as number two, maybe even one. I really did. Just for See, I, I, really accomplishing what it set out to do better than anything else he's written, I think. And you're it's not wrong su- about that. It sucked me in. I like. I still think you're all. All of you are wrong for thinking Pet Cemetery is the best. It is just not my favorite at all. But so if that's number one at this point, I have to start thinking: Did I enjoy this? Was I invested in this more than I was Pet Cemetery? And I was. A lot. I that's how I ranked it. Like that's how I'm looking at it. I compare it. One number one. Is it better or worse than number one? Is it better or worse than number two? And for me, this was better than number one. For me, though, I don't know if it's better than it. And the Shining, but that would be my own personal ranking. Yeah. See, my my question was, we should also uh, it... pull pull our own individual rankings off on a side chart at some point too. Yeah. It doesn't have to happen right now, but that'd be interesting. Yeah. Because I, I was actually bouncing between three and four. Was it better than The Shining, or was it better than Cujo? I, I did think it was better than Cujo, but I wasn't sure if it was better than The Shining. I ultimately chose that I enjoyed it more than The Shining because I liked the small I, I liked the smallness of this book compared to the breadth of even it. You know, like uh, as much as I love the bre- the, the broadness of it. I loved this book for the consolidation, conciseness. So it, that's where I kind of finally fell of liking it more so than The Shining. Uh, because Shining, just there was a few different just jumps and everything. I know Shining's a fan favorite. I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, but I enjoyed it. It's a good story. But Misery, this one, I think it's a solid... Yeah, I could see it being in one or two, too. But... I, I don't know if it's better than if I like it better than it. That's my thing. I yeah. don't think I like. Well, it you also have than nostalgia it. with it, critically. Yeah, I do. I it, mean, it holds a special place in my heart. So it that, sure that one's does. always gonna be. <laughs> so yes, I, I I'm okay with the rankings as they stand. Overall, I'm good with it. Yeah. Okay. I think Cujo right. should be higher, but that's just me. I think the pair should be lower. So Fair. I yeah, that's that's it's always be the case. So. Right. That's where we're taking um, However, I think Carrie is right where it belongs. Uh, in yes, this group. Agreed. Yeah, and I think Salem's Lot. And where, Salem's Lot as well. Oh, I love Salem's Lot. That could be higher for me. I, sh- I should go back and read it, read it one more time. I, I, need to, I need to read it again, but yeah. That's okay. All right. So now we get to our final thoughts. I'm going to start off. Usually I end, but I've been making you guys go first and for yeah, a yeah. smaller crowd. So I, I will start off. My final thought was. I really like when books suck me in. It's really hard for books that I've read before to do that. And this one did. And I very much appreciate it. I liked it much, much better this time than I did when I first read it, you know, decades ago. So I appreciate that. And I really am excited to have you guys read next month's book. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, that's right. All right, Luke. I I really wanted to rank this book even higher than three. I really did. And I, I can't change that now. That's a fundamental rule because I'm steadfast in rules on these things. But I, I really think this book was incredibly successful at the things it set out to do. It was it was so enveloping. And like Melissa, it's so easy to fall into what Paul Sheldon is going through. And it's so well done that... Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a it's a great book. It's highly recommend. I would highly recommend anyone, especially if you are in fandom, if you follow an author at all or an artist, and you're wondering why they're not producing the next thing that you want. Read this book and hesitate when you give them shit on Twitter. Um, I'm just saying, check yourself. Go fuck yourself too. Um, but at the same time, this this book is awesome and just. Three thumbs, way, way up. I mean, Paul Sheldon, one thumb, way, way up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. 
Benji, final thought. All right, final thought. Uh, agree with Luke. It's this one. I actually agree with both of you. This one sucked me in. This is one I slowed down for. I I, I went down to like even one point two five at times just to make sure I'm hearing it there. And for me, that's saying something. That's huge. That's huge. So it's you know I I it's a great story. It's it is fantastic. Uh, one of the best adaptations. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover that as well. On we'll our probably movie two, side week, of two things. weeks from now is what I'm thinking. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, well, I can't film uh, this weekend, so yeah, I can't do it. Yeah, no, I know. It's not happening this weekend. So, but perfect. But, Maybe um, we'll watch it with the family. We'll just put it on the, on the projector <laughs> screen actually, for the whole family at the pond. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> no Wi Fi. That, that could be fun. Uh, but it's just this story, it does suck you in, and the minimal, minimalistic of it. It's one that everybody should read, as Luke said, because you know what? Give the authors a break, but at the same time, don't sleep on your crazy fans. Don't ignore don't your number one them, fans. Either. Don't sleep with them. But, you know, your number one fan, when they say, hey, I'm your number one fan, as I, I'll give the warning out to the author, be nice to them. Maybe send a thanks you know even if it's a stock thing make them feel a little special because you never know who the next annie wilkes may be oh my Just... god i'm sorry so what you're telling me is basically the incredibles is the pixar version of misery yeah yep pretty much okay sorry yeah. Continue. Just... Had a connection. but but <laughs> But no, it really is, you know, this is a fantastic story. It's quick read, and everybody should give this one a chance. Both adaptations of this and the movie are fantastic. So just enjoy, you know, and love your writers, love your listeners, love your readers. That's it. Well said. All right. That finishes us up. So, Benj, take us out. Yes, so make sure you follow us on the socials, on Twitter and Instagram, at Floats Down Here. Send us a digital axed foot at uh, floatsdownhere at gmail.com. Send us a digital like pre-op shot. Yeah, pre-op shot. And by that, like uh, maybe like Jameson. All your free samples of medicine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, talking about, like, I'm talking about like whiskey or something. <laughs> like, yeah. Find all of our shows at the podcast that.com plus ways to support us. Subscribe and rate us on iTunes and YouTube under Drawbridge Media on YouTube. Yeah, and if you didn't see the live stream that we did just before this, Melissa and I talked all about our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons, which you can learn more about uh, everything we have going on at Patreon at patreon.com slash stay imaginary, where you can learn about our cool reward tiers and how you can also become one. Join us next month as we discuss our next Stephen King book called Needful Things, which is a mysterious new shop that opens in Castle Rock, which always seems to stock the deepest desire of each shopper with a price far heavier than expected. This, this sounds like a Rick and Morty episode. <laughs> it's the same thing I thought. <laughs> I think that's where You'll I float. <laughs> You'll blow too. Stay imaginary. Thanks. The podcast that floats down here. <laughs>「Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran.」「Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first-time Stephen King reader. 